Good afternoon, everybody from uh, Lesotho um, in Southern Africa. I'm, I'm delighted to be joining uh, our LEU UK this afternoon to talk about a subject that is very important to me. But this subject is one that I could speak about all day because it's very important to me, but I think should be important to libraries, but particularly those of us who are concerned with digital shifts and equity in access to, to knowledge. Um, this is the title of my presentation, and um, uh, I will speak this afternoon on, on digital initiatives in Africa and creating an environment for digital equity. And I'm delighted to be joining you. That's the head, uh, top topic of my discussion this afternoon, but I particularly look forward to engagement uh, with uh, the colleagues that are participating uh, at the end of my presentation. This will be the outline of my presentation. I do it more to order my thoughts um, uh, and, 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 and in how the conversation is going to flow. I will talk about, the, first there'll be an introduction and I will go on to talk about uh, infrastructure initiatives that provide um, a framework, uh, a structure within which digital content can be transmitted. A key element of that is skills development um, on the continent of Africa. And then I will talk about uh, something that preoccupies us a lot as librarians, uh, how to uh, increase the digital content and what is happening in that area of uh, digital content. And then I will uh, then conclude. So in terms of introduction, um, as you may have been aware from the inference from the abstract, this paper will explore Africa-wide uh, development in initiatives around digital infrastructure, creation of digital content, as well as uh, skills development. It also explores other and new initiatives that have emerged, especially during the period of COVID-19. It also expl uh, explores the whole question of how digital equity can be achieved in Africa in order that Africa's youthful population will find re relevant content online. So when I talk about Africa, I'm not talking about one country. I'm talking about 54 different countries that have different jurisdiction and sometimes different languages um, and different ways and different laws governing their access to information. And so that means that the, the practices, the legal framework, the technological framework, and even the language may vary as much as the colors of the, uh, of the map will vary. And in my presentation, I will touch uh, with, on examples from a number of countries. And obviously one cannot speak about a continent as large as Africa. Uh, ably in 25 minutes, but I will draw on some examples um, uh, and we'll read further and discuss further about examples from elsewhere. Furthermore, the population of Africa is 17.2% of the world's population, but the bulk of it is under 50 years of age. Over 20% is under the 50 years of age. And that is Africa's hope that the youthful population of Africa um, will demand a digital infrastructure in which we they work. Because as we know, millenniums been on online and in order for live, I mean, live online. And in order for libraries to remain relevant to the youthful population, they have to work on putting more and more content online. You'll have seen in research, that only 4% of African digital content is, is available uh, compared to 96% of the world's. And that is a big concern for a continent whose population is 17% is of the world's population. One would have thought that perhaps the amount of digital content should go somewhere close to um, the population size, but not so different. Also significantly, if you look at the map on the right, only two um, archives, and these are physical archives, are on this map. And this map is, is either inaccurate or 
um, represents what the one who created the map knew. And this needs to be changed by exposing more um, African archives and African libraries. And I hope that by the time uh, we, 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 we finish this presentation, we'll be thinking differently about this, but also that by the time a number of projects come into play, this map would look different. This is an important slide in that it, it shares what is the thinking at Africa wide level within the African Union, that priorities for cooperation and development uh, are especially around uh, digital transformation, speak to the need for improvement of the digital infrastructure as a major priority, but also development of di uh, digital skills as a second major priority. And that this locates this at, at the highest level in Africa of the African Union. And I see that in many countries that have developed digital transformation strategies, that creation of a digital infrastructure takes priority related to uh, creation of essential skills or development of essential skills, and then also the issues of, of content. So in terms of infrastructure, what is it that confronts us? This has become important, especially with the um, uh, increase of, uh, with, because, in the era of COVID-19, because more and more content has become digital, but the whole process of digitalization has increased during COVID-19. Also important because um, if, 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 our, if, our, if, our, if our, our structure is not, structures are not particularly protected and people are not aware of issues around cybersecurity, it would endanger a lot of the work that we do and people's rights online. So the ITU also shows that a number of African countries are committed to issues of cybersecurity. Um, 29 of the countries have passed legislation to promote cybersecurity and Tanzania and Mauritius lead the pack and also spend it energy and investment uh, educating their citizens about the value of um, uh, cybersecurity. Internet speed is a crucial element of the infrastructure because it speaks to the ability uh, to, to transport content and the quantities that we can transport. Uh, uh, colleagues will be aware that a number of African countries still use 3G networks and uh, by June 2021, only about seven um, uh, 5G networks were active across the continent. And, and that indicate that the speed is not really too fast. The internet speed in, in a number of our countries is a bit slow. And that again speaks to the amount we can up, upload. A favorite one for me in the infrastructure um, is, is the cellular penetration in Africa that has been spoken very widely about, uh, that is it's quite wide, 46% of the world's. Um, and, and the implication for a youthful population is that then most of our content must be mobile friendly so that we can reach um, uh, younger populations. This busy slide, um, but you can look at later, again, uh, speaks to the extent to which a uh, mobile economy is penetrated uh, sub-Saharan Africa. In terms of skills development, infrastructure is one leg, skills development is another important leg when we talk about digital transformation. And we've seen that, uh, that in, a, in an earlier slide that uh, development of digital skills is important on the continent and it is really been placed as a priority at the African Union, but also in the different countries. Uh, there's been a surge in, in online training during COVID-19 because it, it was the, largely the only way of doing business. Higher education also came to the party by increasing digital literacy offerings so that students could work and learn online. Um, but there's always a question of what then happens to the wider community 
who takes responsibility for developing their skills? Is it government? Is it private sector? Uh, and are, or are they left to fend for themselves? And in this slide, we'll see some examples and some initiatives. So there's a number of activities that have happened related to the library sector. And I've just picked one, uh, work that's done by Lipsense uh, in order to develop uh, skills of librarians and research networks. Um, and this is one link to a workshop that was done to develop skills of librarians to work and operate in the uh, uh, digital environment. There's also national training uh, um, interventions, and I'll share just a few, uh, one from South Africa, one from Kenya, one from, from Ghana. Uh, the National Library of South Africa, while it does offer training on an ongoing basis, took advantage of the Presidential Employment Stimulus Plan, and that was uh, offered by President uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, to alleviate the challenges of COVID and give skills to young people. So the National Library of South Africa created a project and trained 413 uh, young graduates in digitization and also employed them to do some digitization work. And I'll talk about it a little bit later, but this was an example of uh, taking opportunity to give digitization skills to a group of young graduates. In Ghana and Kenya, if you go to the websites of those uh, libraries, you'll see that there is a, 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 a link to training programs and national libraries have taken a responsibility to provide general population with digital skills and different types of digital skills, um, both in Kenya and uh, in, in Ghana. The question is always, is that adequate? Is the work being done by the national libraries adequate to cover the populations? In terms of the digital content development, once you've got the infrastructure and you've developed the skills, the next um, leg is creation of the digital content that will then move on that infrastructure, particularly related to libraries. In my earlier slide, I talked about um, that there's 4% digital content from Africa, and there's the dire need to increase at 40%. The number of us from the continent are committed to seeing that 4% increase. There's also um, a, a need to decolonize the space by way of bringing in more voices from the global south, bringing in more voices, dig digital spaces from Africa bringing in more voices from marginalized so that uh, digital spaces are not occupied only by leading voices, only voices of power, but that there is more, uh, uh, more voices that are heard in digital space. Thirdly, it's crucial that the youth of Africa that are, are increasingly working uh, in digital space find relevant content for their engagement. So that when they go online, they can recognize themselves. They don't find only content from elsewhere without content from their own space. So, so crucial, fourthly, for supporting research with appropriate content, research that uh, works towards national development and development of the continent, but also for policy development, that there is need therefore to increase that content uh, from Africa in digital spaces. So some examples, again, where there's been efforts to increase the digital content. I mentioned the National Library of South Africa's uh, skills development project, but in the one year that the project was on, the National Library of South Africa and the National Archives were able to add 250,789 uh, uh, documents online. Uh, that were otherwise only available in print. And that's quite a massive increase of digital content added. Um, libraries are working increasingly as publishers uh, using the open access framework to publish journals, peer reviewed journals from their universities, from neighboring universities and neighboring countries. And I have examples that I'm sharing there from the University of Cape Town, 
uh, there is a they, they publish both books and refereed uh, journals. Um, uh, my own National University of Lesotho, we've piloted now with three journals and are working on increasing them. University of Stellenbosch um, has a number of journals that it also publishes uh, and some from beyond South Africa. And in, um, uh, in Ghana, the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology is a space where they, where they publish um, online um, journals from their university. There's also other projects. And one that is really in the upcoming is the Africa Commons in which a number of organizations, uh, an organization based in the US, but working with partners in Africa to digitize and disseminate Africa's cultural heritage, to promote digital repatriation, uh, to bring African resources and African digital content to Western scholars and Western institutions, and build an interest and understanding of Africa and its people as equals, enabling us to eyeball each other in the digital spaces. And, and um, uh, the project seeks uh, to provide online tools to institutions to be able to digitize, disseminate, and discover. And the link uh, to the Africa Commons is provided there. Other initiatives that I want to share, um, African Journals Online, that um, the link is provided there. That's a database of online journals published in Africa. There's work that Lipsens does um, that promotes both the library and the national research uh, 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 networks in publishing content from library, creating a policy framework, creating skills, creating infrastructure in order that there may be a framework within which uh, African content can be uh, made digitally available. And forthcoming is a project called Hidden Collections Africa which the Council on Library and Information Resources is working on. Again, working towards digitizing hidden collections in Africa that are currently maybe only available in print. And so as I draw to a conclusion, it is evident from the few examples that I've drawn and the work that the libraries are doing to publish and to digitize that there is a there is uh, a commitment from Africa to work towards digi achieving digital equity in order that knowledge development represents all of humanity, that the African voice is, is part of humanity's voices, that the voices that are in those spaces uh, represents all of humanity, not just one, one, one sector. And there's a lot that we all can start to think about what can we do to make this possible? What is it that we can contribute in to work towards digital equity? What is it that our institution, our network can, can do um, to work towards digital equity? It's crucial that we all uh, work towards decolonizing knowledge. It's so important that as knowledge workers, we can eyeball each other, we can work as equals, and ensure that knowledge from different parts of the world um, becomes available uh, for human development. And for us in Africa, it's especially crucial for, for, for our young populations that they can find that digital content online. Um, again, we must ask ourselves, what are the possibilities? What does it mean to decolonize uh, knowledge? Um, what is, are some of the ways that we can engage with this discussion and take it forward. And as you have seen uh, from examples that I've shared here today, African institutions are working together with their partners to pursue presence and significance in digital spaces so that Africa's youthful population will find relevant content, will build on the relevant content that they find, will find themselves and identify with being are they, are being, being online and that they will not be othered or that they will not feel like foreigners online because the content that is there does not really speak to them. 
And, and in closing then, this, this um, quotation from Elo Uma really spoke to some of what I've been trying to say this afternoon, that Africa's digital transformation offers an exciting opportunity, but the success requires solutions that reflect the context and, one, and nuances of the continent's needs. And that, I thought, summarizes well what I've been saying uh, this afternoon. So I thank you for your attention and for joining me this afternoon. And I look forward uh, to further engagement with you. I thank you. Thank you so much, Bishley. That's a really interesting talk. Um, and we're starting to get some questions coming in already. Um, so I'll just pose a few to you just now. Um, you talk a lot about skills development and you mentioned some really interesting skills development programmes that are going on. What do you think the continued role of collaboration is going to play in that going forward? Please say that again, Lisa. Sorry, speaking too fast. Um, you talked a lot about skills development that's going on at the moment. And I just wonder if you'd be able to say what role collaboration is going to play in the skills programme development going forward. Thank you very much. I, I think, I think um, there is a lot that we can do together. We are stronger together. Um, when we talk about skills development, it obviously says somebody has the skills and somebody must be developed. And as I've shared this afternoon, uh, a number of organizations that have gone ahead of us, um, a number of institutions that are here that maybe have gone ahead of us that are citizens of the digital spaces may be able to identify the skill sets that they have developed and could offer those to institutions uh, in Africa and work together collaboratively to develop skills. And African institutions that have gone ahead also could work collaboratively with other, their neighbors and other institutions who want to, who are committed to increasing digital content to develop their skills. I think identifying opportunities for collaboration, uh, especially now that we are working largely in a virtual environment and we can share some of these skills digitally that we don't need to be traveling. We can do this uh, from the comfort of our home. That's great, thank you. Um, you also talked a lot about infrastructure um, and what do you think libraries can do um, with, about infrastructure going forward? So libraries themselves don't build the infrastructure. We benefit from a good infrastructure, but I think sharing best practice uh, and sharing, sharing some of the infrastructure that has worked um, uh, could be beneficial, but some of the work that leaps and starts to influence policy um, that affects infrastructure um, is crucial. Our networks can work together to influence policy development that either uh, speeds up the development of infrastructure or opens up the infrastructure. And so working together in the area of policy development is really, uh, is really crucial. Um, and and what, that's why collaboration based, the numbers game uh, could really help us um, to, to influence policy development in terms of infrastructure. Thank you. Um, you also talked a little bit about decolonization of knowledge, and I wonder if you wouldn't mind expanding upon that a little bit and maybe how that speaks to libraries as publishers. Yes, um, I, I often tell a story, and I think previously when I spoke, I, I, I tell a story of uh, how the, some of the books I read when I was growing up were um, um, about Thomas Hardy and, and daffodils that don't grow in, in Southern Africa. And, 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 and I, I, I could imagine what daffodils were. And I, I didn't get to know what they were until many, many years uh, later. That there's really need to, to put content that is, that is relevant to people in Africa, that is familiar to people in Africa that makes them not foreigners in digital spaces. So that let, we, we need to create an environment where there are more voices, 
there are more voices in terms of digital content, there are more voices and more knowledges from marginalized populations. And when I speak about decolon decolonizing knowledge spaces, really saying knowledge spaces should, should, uh, should include my type of knowledge, should include knowledge from people of the South, that we shouldn't be hearing only a Northern voice, that digital spaces should not be dominated by one culture or one language, and that we should be hearing different thinkings, different processes. And I think we are enriched by that. We are enriched by hearing from all of humanity so that digital spaces is a citizenship space for all of us, not just some groups, not just um, some genders, and not just some uh, languages. That's great. Uh, Carol also has a question that's, that's following on from this one, and it's about decolonized African content, and it's about born digital content, so things that are in social media or community issues. She's asking whether the national libraries are sort of engaged in some um, selective web archiving, or if there's any community ar archiving going on to sort of preserve and develop that cultural heritage. So I'm 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 not aware of that work except the work that's done by the um, Bib Alex, the the, Bibli the uh, Alexandrina uh, Library. Um, I'm not aware of other activities by national libraries, but it's a crucial work that needs to be done. And I think issues of climate change, the fires that have gutted libraries, uh, floods that have flooded some libraries, wars have made this even more imperative that national libraries, university libraries, national archives should really be committing and working actively towards digital preservation of both born digital and uh, even printed. So printed work. So I'm not aware of some of this, but it could be an area of growth. That sounds great. Um, I have a few questions now around the Ar African archives that you refer to. Uh, Garabad, sorry, I said that wrong, I think, but she asks, um, can you clarify which two Ar African archives you're referring to in your presentation? Not sure if you would know that. I'm not sure which ones they are because those little, those little flags uh, seem to start in one country and add in another. Um, but I suspect uh, from where they sit, they are both in Southern Africa. So it could be um, that they are referring to some in South Africa, um, and some in Botswana and, and, and Zimbabwe. Um, but there are archives in Kenya, in Uganda, um, in Egypt, in, in, in Algeria. Um, and and, and um, I think it could be a project that could be worked on to, to work on improving that map so that it is representative, so that it reflects um, where some of those um, uh, archives are, are located. But I think what could also be even more interesting could be um, in addition to locating those archives, that really deliberate effort of working on digitizing their content so that it is available online uh, are also, also pursued. That sounds great. Kareem in the chat has also said um, there's the Open Archive, which is Seth of Algiers. So that's one that's, that's ongoing at the moment. Um, Jeff Rowell at King's College London also says, thank you so much for the presentation. And he says that he'd be keen to cooperate via the Archives Africa project that they helped to launch a few years ago um, to continue to support African colleagues um, with that. And sort of leading on from that comment, there's another question in the chat that says, would you consider partnership working between libraries in the UK and in Africa? I think it's, it's, it's crucial, especially for historical reasons. UK and many African countries share, have a shared history. And, and, and I think the whole question of digital repatriation uh, takes on a different meaning because 
um, it's it, it, it's one of those very low hanging fruit uh, in the relationship between British archives or British institutions archives and African archives, because there could either be duplication or there could be archives that were, were moved to the UK at the end of the colonial era. So, so it really sets a, 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 a low hanging fruit of, for, for digital repatriation um, of, of collections that have already been digitized so that wherever they are in Africa, they are not starting from scratch. Um, we importing work that's already been digitized. So digital repatriation is one, but also um, a skills exchange in the digitization process is also another. Um, and, and I also think that actually um, also um, finding opportunity to co-digitize as it were. Uh, and exchange and exchange um, uh, the, the 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 digitized content, so it is not just one way traffic. While there's repatriation on another, there's also a process of enhancing. Um, we did a similar, we did a, such a project um, when I worked at UNISA uh, between uh, an institution in Germany and the UNISA Library, in which we were exchanging the work of the Jews, Jesuit missionary societies where some content was held at the University of uh, South Africa Library and some content was held at the University of Hamburg. And we were able to digitize and exchange and both institutions got richer in the process. So it's really finding uh, such low hanging fruit that we could work together to enhance uh, both our institutions. That project sounds absolutely fascinating. Um, a bit of a broader one now, uh, Suzanne has asked, is the publishing world doing enough to support African journal publishing, e.g. through indexing and global databases? Um, no, <laughs> I think more could be done. And I was hoping I could avoid this topic, but I, I'll talk about it now. Sorry. Um, the, 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 more could be done to index African journals in global databases, but there's a whole lot of politics there. Um, and it often goes to quality and I often ask quality, what quality my food? Because um, it, it, a lot of African scholars re referee their journals. And so when those scholars write in Africa and referee each other's work, does the quality suddenly change? But so more work needs to be done. But another area that I think has disadvantaged Africa is the whole area around open access, while it offered hope for, for increasing the voices from Africa and the global south. As more and more publishers have gone this route and increased their page fees, a new form of exclusion has emerged where African uh, scholars cannot afford the huge author pay fees. And, and, and the voices are again being, being marginalized. And that's why the growth of um, online publishing that some institutions are doing uh, in Africa is become so important so that we can publish in a way that we can afford, but also the good quality work of the scholars from Africa can be uploaded to digital spaces and people can read and learn what is um, research going on in Africa, especially now during the pandemic, when we need to be exchanging information. And we saw just how important it was um, in the discovery of Omicron, that it's important, so important to share information. So true at the moment, it really is. Um, Jane's got another question, um, which again talks a little bit about the, the digital content side of things. So she's asking, um, what is being digitized at the moment? Is it mostly historic material or is it modern material um, and, and your things? I wonder if you can answer that one. So, so as you know about in the area of digitization, the, 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 the elephant in the room is usually copyright. Um, and if we, can, if, if, if we can find, get permission from authors, we will digitize even current, current work and work that's been born digital. But if we don't have copyright, then we focus on work that is uh, in the public domain and that is historic. 
But my 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 view is that it is important to preserve both history, but also current knowledge, because we do need to promote current research, and and the pandemic has taught us again uh, about the importance of sharing current information timely. I think if if the if those databases had been closed, we might not have been able to learn about Omicron uh, as easily as we did because the databases were open. Yeah, that's true. It's it's amazing how quickly that knowledge came to light um, and how how well it was shared and how did the world's been able to use it so effectively. Um, just a few comments in the chat here. I think um, Jenny Skinner says, um, th thank you again for an amazing presentation. Um, she says, as SCOMA, which is um, UK Libraries and Archives Group in Africa, seeks to widen membership and participation, is there any way that we can formally contribute to these efforts and collaborate as a group? Um, and she says she hopes that maybe she can speak to Jeff from King's College on that one as well. I'd be really delighted to follow up on these conversations um, uh, after this presentation, because I think there is real opportunity for collaboration. And there are many opportunities for collaboration. SCORMA working together with um, Isabika and, and other archive organizations um, within Africa. It's, it's crucial. The, 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 this is, the, the, this is a time to uh, almost as it were to be open and to grow together because sharing that information is so crucial. So I really would be happy to continue this conversation um, with uh, Jeff and I didn't see who started oh, with chat. Jenny. With Jenny. Yes, yeah. please, I'd be happy for us to, to, to chat. And Stuart Dempster from the University of Southampton also says that there might be an opportunity to coordinate future collaboration with the Commonwealth Education Programme. Um, and he's put a link in the chat to, to that, or UNESCO, he says as well. Yes, um, and UNESCO, uh, UNESCO has really done great work uh, by publishing the, the new guidelines, the new recommendations on open science. And I think those will go a long way towards creating um, a policy framework within which higher education in Africa can grow um, the sharing of, of its own research, research in open spaces. <clears throat> because the guidelines. Yeah. Stuart Dempster also provide asked a good again. framework. Oh. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry, I, th sorry I, th I, think, I think your internet dropped out a bit. Must be those uh, Senate exams that are going on at the moment. Um, Stuart Dempster is also asking again, to what extent the services like Future Learn get used and is there the opportunity to develop some co-designed OER content? I was coughing, I didn't hear that question. Oh, sorry. Um, Stuart Dempster has also asked, um, to what extent the services like um, Future Learn get used um, and also is there some opportunity to develop some co-designed OER content? Higher education in Africa is committed to OER content. And, 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 and we often say that we, as higher education, we don't want to be net consumers of OER, but net contributors. And so there's a real opportunity for collaboration. Um, and the fields of health have done incredibly well with OER, uh, collaborative uh, OER, and exchanging health information and co jointly developing content as well as uh, publishing health journals in open access has really helped the content the continent grow so yes there is room for collaboration in the oer uh, development as well that sounds great um you talked a bit in your presentation about um an african commons how far away do you think that is from coming to fruition um, a lot of work has, uh, has gone on, and even as we speak, there's a meeting going on. Um, and, and I think the launch date is sometime in April. And so a lot of content has already been made uh, available on Africa Commons. Um, and, and work 
to um, um, find more institutions to participate is 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 going on. Um, the, the real opportunity for that is that it's um, it speeds up and scales digitization because the the the, they use metadata. I mean, they use um, AI to create metadata so that it speeds up the process of discoverability of content. Um, and so we're really looking forward to that. I think the launch date is April, but I can't give an exact date. Sure. That sounds fascinating because I know that we've had a lot of discussion in the UK about the yes. use of AI with metadata. Um, you also talked about. Um, bringing that content to Western students and scholars, how, how do you think you might go about that? And so um, there'll be a deliberate effort uh, by, by Africa Commons to market this content to Western countries, I mean, to Western institutions. And the model, the model we hope will work this way, that the content will be open and freely available in Africa and will be available on subscription to institutions that can afford it or that are in the West. And some of the income will go back to those uh, institutions so they can digitize more content. So it's, it's, it's a model that we hope will help to create capacity for digitization, but also sustainable digitization because the equipment is expensive. So the dual model of free for Africa and the South but also at a subscription for institutions that can afford. Um, and, and, and we've seen a lot of interest uh, when we've made a, a, a presentation on, on the topic. Yeah, certainly. I know that's something at Sussex we'd be very interested in, um, if you'd like to work with. Um, I've got another question from Jodie Butterworth. Uh, Jody Butterworth. Um, they talk about the Endangered Archives Programme, um, which provides funding to digitise materials in regions where resources are limited. Nigeria continually ranks fourth or fifth in accessing digital content. What can we do to raise the profile of this material so that other African countries can access this material? Um, so I'm not sure what whether that fourth or fifth is accessing is it a positive or is it a, 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 a not a positive? Uh, what can we do to raise the profile of this material to other countries? I think it's, it's marketing it and making it available in more places um, uh, that, that more, more, more marketable. I hope that it can connect, for example, with Africa Commons. Uh, it can connect with uh, some of the organizations that are, are in Africa. Um, and that we market that widely so that other organizations can, can, uh, can, can see. And, and for sure, I think our colleagues in Africa Commons uh, uh, would, would want to, to connect with that. It's also, again, about um, um, sustaining the stuff that has been digitized. What we often find is that some stuff is digitized and then the links are lost. And, and then they're not, then the content is not easily discoverable or that the funding changes and then uh, institutions, and then the, the content gets locked away. Mm -hmm. So there is a sense in which you need to keep, keep checking whether this content is not somewhere lost in the web, that the links are not broken, that it is in spaces where it can be discovered, that it is shared widely on platforms uh, like this. That's great, thank you very much. Um, the RL UK executive have posted a question actually. Um, they've also said thank you for your presentation. They'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on the potential of virtual reading rooms as a way of providing virtual access to collections that doesn't depend on digitization. I'd be keen to, to, to explore further discussion on that because that's content that's already available digitally. And we are not, as I said, not only looking at historical content, we are looking at, irrele at relevant content, that the youth can find relevant content as they go online. So we'd be keen to, to explore further how the virtual reading room um, could partner with institutions in Africa to grow um, uh, access to digital content. And also how we could put African content into those spaces. 
so that it, it's a two-way traffic. Yeah, thank you. Um, you talked a lot at the beginning of your presentation about the challenges of working at that sort of continental um, sort of level with the 54 countries. Um, and I imagine that, that must be a huge challenge. Do you have any sort of smaller regional things going on that you, you're contributing to at the moment? Um, or anything to talk about around that? Yes, I often say when I talk about Africa, you know, it's like when you, if you must eat an elephant, you must eat it in small bites. Um, and, and, and so an approach that, that looks uh, from the East and, and from the West and for your convergence is, is important because as I said, these are not only different countries, it's different languages, it's different cultures. And so you'll find that uh, a regional approach countries with a similar language group um, working together would help. Countries with similar, a cultural group working together, but we do need to work together at continental level as well, so that we can share, we can share information. And so platforms like this, platforms that share information um, uh, digitally, platforms that encourage working collaboratively across uh, the continent then become important but to be aware that really one of the challenges is language. Um, one of the challenges is infrastructure that varies from country to country. Um, lang um, uh, technology, infrastructure, um, and, and also um, legislation um, that, that varies from country to country. But we must overcome them because the cause is bigger. We've got to increase that 4% and work to change the infrastructure, the policy environment, uh, develop those skills so that we can increase that 4%. It is imperative. Africa's youth needs it. Thank you very much, that's great. Um, I just had another question on skills development programs. Um, I think given the, the flux we've had in the last few years with the pandemic um, and what have you, have you got any sort of new ideas for skills development, things that you think you might need to take um, to the next generation of, of students and young people? Yeah, I, I think um, time, the time to discuss whether we should be introducing digital literacy at what level in education is long past. I think we should be assessing the impact of the old programs, looking to identify gaps, in skills development, whether it's institutionally or continentally or nationally, that we're constantly looking at um, our own practices. Have they benefited? Have they taken us to where we want to go? Are there skills gaps? And do that on an ongoing basis. What other interventions should we be developing to close those gaps? What opportunities? Who should we be collaborating with? Uh, because as libraries and library institutions, we can't do everything by ourselves but we can collaborate with others to develop those skills. We can collaborate with uh, universities. We can collaborate with ICT institutions, but it's important to assess the gaps, to assess the impact of our programs and identify new areas in which we need to, to be training people and giving people um, a new skills. The area of cybersecurity is a new and growing and crucial area. And the area of, of digitization, as we saw in um, South Africa, if we are focusing on historical documents and archives, is, is crucial um, and, and, and urgent because uh, this is accidents of fires and floods uh, will uh, eliminate our history um, if we don't put our, preserve our content digitally. Thank you. Um, and a final question from Carol. She says that job one certainly does seem to be as much content as possible, but she wonders if there's also broad efforts in shared discovery portals or other shared discovery efforts of some kind. So I was reading the question. Um, we, can never, we can never overshare. We can never have enough sharing. And so it's important that we're constantly sharing on job one, but sharing also in other spaces because discoverability is about sharing and putting, putting the things we know in spaces that can be 
discovered to avoid duplication, to avoid reinventing the wheel, but also to share, share skills. So it's important that we share, we publish in as many spaces as possible, in as many networks as we can, and that we speak with each other. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Um, thank you so much, Bishley, for your both your presentation today and for answering everything I threw at you there, because there was a lot of varied questions. I hope that this is just the start of a bigger conversation. Um, I think there's certainly lots of people in the chat who are keen to speak further with you and, and get involved in some of the work you're doing. Um, so I hope that this is just the start of something, something good um, to come between us all. Um, thank you, Liz. I think there will be plenty of conversations. Um, we do talk about what, what, what more can we do after this presentation and uh, contributions on the chat uh, are so important to how we go forward from here. There was a question about whether this chat would be saved in order for us to follow up. I'm sure it will be, but I am looking forward to us engaging with the colleagues that had an interest in sharing, uh, in reconnecting after this meeting so that we can find opportunities um, to, to collaborate. We can find opportunities to work together um, uh, because the elephant is big and we, we need to work together um, to consume it. <laughs>